Welcome to the special event of the Crime Congress, The Nature of Corruption. I'm Jorge Rios, and I'm the chief of the UNODC Global Program for Combating Wildlife and Forest Crime. Over the last several years, there has been increasing recognition that to curb the global surge in wildlife trafficking, the international community must accelerate its efforts to understand, prevent, and address the pervasive corruption that both enables it and is a consequence of it. These crimes constitute an increasing source of profit for criminal groups and fuel environmental degradation, including the destruction and illegal exploitation of forests, our wildlife and marine resources, contributing to biodiversity loss and climate change. Corruption in wildlife, forest and fisheries crime is well documented, including in UNODC's World Wildlife Crime Reports. It is multifaceted and occurs at every stage of the trafficking chain. Today's event has been organized jointly by UNODC's Corruption and Economic Crimes Branch, the Global Program for Combating Wildlife and Forest Crime, and the Research and Trends Analysis Branch. Our event today features speakers who are leaders in the fight to address corruption linked to wildlife, forest, and fisheries crime, and who will share with us the challenges they face in their efforts to address them. To provide the welcoming remarks, I now have the pleasure and the honor to introduce UNODC's Executive Director and Undersecretary General, Ms. Jara Welly. Ms. Welly, you have the floor. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special event on tackling corruption as an enabler of wildlife, forest, and fisheries crime. The 2020 World Wildlife Crime Report from the UN Office on Drugs and Crime highlights the role of corruption at every stage of trafficking. For instance, bribes can make up to 10% of the final wholesale value of ivory in Asia. False documentation is used to launder species caught in the wild. Fraudulently acquired permits bring illegal wildlife products to market. The illegal exploitation of forests, wildlife and marine resources leaves local communities poorer, destroys biodiversity and threatens our climate, our security and our health. As the guardian of the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and the UN Convention Against Corruption, UNODC offers integrated support to member states to address these challenges. Through our global programs and field office network, we assist wildlife, forest and fisheries authorities to identify and mitigate corruption risks. We build investigation capacity and promote interagency coordination, including between financial investigation units and prosecutors. Our office also supports countries with research to inform policymaking, identify gaps in legislation and pinpoint the vulnerabilities of legal markets to infiltration by organized crime groups. 2021 is shaping up to be a milestone year for anti-corruption action. The world will come together at the first ever General Assembly Special Session Against Corruption in June, and again at the ninth conference of the state parties to the UN Convention Against Corruption in Sharm el-Sheikh in December. As countries mobilize to recover with integrity from the COVID-19 crisis, let's seize the opportunity to disrupt the corrupt networks that profit from and perpetuate wildlife, forest and fisheries crime. UNODC is here to support you so that we can protect people and planet and deliver on the 2030 agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Executive Director Welly. Now to provide the opening remarks, I have the honor to introduce Lord Haig. Lord William Haig is the chair of the United for Wildlife Task Force, an unprecedented collaboration between seven of the world's most influential conservation organizations and the Royal Foundation, which is committed to tackling the global challenges that threaten the world's natural resources. The task force aims to increase the global response to conservation crimes through supporting new and innovative ways to protect animals from poaching combined forces, notably with the private sector, to crack down on trafficking and change global mindsets and reduce demand for illicit wildlife products. Lord Haig was first elected to the British Parliament in 1989 and was re-elected a further five times. He has served in many roles, including as Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom 
from 2010 to 2014. Lord Haig, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jorge, for the introduction. And thank you for asking me to speak to the UN Congress about the illegal wildlife trade, one of the worst and most destructive of crimes in the whole world. And we have seen an explosion of criminality in this area in recent years. Somewhere in the world, every 30 minutes, an elephant is killed for its tusks. Every eight hours, an African rhino is killed for its horn. One in five of all the fish caught in the world are caught illegally. And in certain countries, particularly in Africa and South America, between 50% and 90% of timber is harvested and traded illegally. Now, it's often said that the value of the illegal wildlife trade is around 20 billion US dollars per year. But according to World Bank reports, if we add in the illegal logging and fishing, this jumps to no less than between one and two trillion dollars a year. More than 90% of these losses are from ecosystems that forests, wildlife, and coastal resources provide, and that are not currently priced by the market, causing damage to carbon storage, biodiversity, water filtration, and flood retention. Illegal trade in wildlife can undermine climate change adaptation efforts, particularly ecosystem-based adaptation, which uses the preservation of ecosystems and the maintenance of biodiversity as an overall strategy. Behind this devastation is corruption. Illegal logging, fishing, and the wildlife trade are enabled by systematic corruption and weak governance across the public and private sectors. Corruption is rife within these illegal trades. And there's a great deal of evidence of bribery to obtain permits for export or the collection of trade restricted species. There's evidence of knowingly overlooking or authorization of false information on permits for the export of species such as animals collected from the wild and then exported as if they have been bred in captivity. There are sentencing anomalies in the courts, tampering with evidence and leakage of illegal items from stockpiles of seized uh, items. This is the story of corruption in many countries. So we have been working with the Royal Foundation at the request of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Cambridge, to create United for Wildlife. United for Wildlife started out with just 12 forward-thinking organizations in 2016. Now we have nearly 250 members and partners spread around the globe. These are airlines, um, banks, freight forwarding companies, shipping lines, payment companies, many of the largest companies in the world. And United for Wildlife is a central platform to host successful public-private sector partnerships to tackle the illegal wildlife trade. It's the first of its kind by connecting public, private and third sectors on this issue. It is a gateway to support illegal wildlife trade law enforcement efforts. And this is shown by the role that our task forces have played in the breakup and extradition of the largest ivory and heroin trafficking network in East Africa and many other cases. Building on this momentum in January, we saw the Kenyan government agree to the first extradition of a Kenyan citizen for wildlife crimes. But this is not just about arrests and seizures. Regulatory changes are also taking effect. We have been instrumental in assisting the Financial Action Task Force, the global money laundering and terrorist financing watchdog, in raising the profile of the illegal wildlife trade and in making this a priority for that group. 
The public-private partnerships model is beginning to be used at key hubs around the world, with the South African Financial Intelligence Center establishing the South African Anti-Money Laundering Integrated Task Force, SAMLIT, with the illegal wildlife trade as its first item on the agenda, given the convergence of the illegal wildlife trade with trafficking in other products and with money laundering. Bringing the private sector into the strategy to combat the illegal wildlife trade has led to instrumental changes by restricting how criminals operate. No longer is this a problem for the conservation sector or law enforcement to face alone. Even the most basic criminal network needs a logistics network and a way to move money. Our transport and financial task forces are now focused on that. Given the recent pandemic and the global appetite to address biodiversity and climate change issues, Meetings such as this prevent, present an important opportunity to push for increased awareness and policy changes, particularly in the law enforcement sector. This is particularly necessary given the transnational and organized nature of this criminal activity, which all of our law enforcement agencies should be involved in preventing. New programs like the Global Initiative to End Wildlife Crime are springing up to unite voices and to highlight gaps in regulation where we need to revise outdated policies. And we now need new frameworks to better reflect the risks we face. There are four specific actions I believe we should take. One, ensure that the illegal wildlife trade and environmental crime more broadly is a money laundering predicate offense. Two, Use financial investigations to go beyond poachers and seizures to combat broader criminal syndicates. Three, encourage public-private partnerships and financial information sharing to make full use of the work that the private sector has done already in this area. And four, add wildlife crime to the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime so that these crimes and their facilitation by corruption are addressed with the appropriate resources. How many more warnings do we need from nature? We must act now to raise awareness of these crucial issues and begin implementing solutions before it is too late. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Lord Haig. It's a true privilege to be working alongside the United for Wildlife. I'm now pleased to introduce the next segment of this special event, which features the distinguished and passionate voices of those who have devoted themselves to combating crime and corruption linked to natural resources. We look forward to a spirited discussion about how we can urgently address the challenges posed by crime and corruption to biodiversity and to climate change. The following dialogue is moderated by Her Royal Highness, Princess Laurentine of the Netherlands. Her Royal Highness has worked on sustainable and environmental issues for many years. In 2020, she was elected president of Fauna and Flora International, the world's oldest and international wildlife conservation organization, after having served as vice president since 2006. She has also been a fellow of the European Climate Foundation, focusing on mitigating climate change, and she's also a special advisor for Rewilding Europe, a Dutch foundation which aims to create rewilded landscapes across Europe. Building on her extensive experience as a dialogue facilitator, she is passionate for bringing together different organizations and individuals as a basis for developing systematic solutions, notably to promote environmental protection and conservation. Joining her today for this dialogue are Dr. Erustus Kanga, who joins us representing the Cabinet Secretary for Tourism and Wildlife of Kenya. He is currently the Secretary for Wildlife at the Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife in Kenya. Dr. Kanga has had a long career in biodiversity conservation, including 16 years working with the Kenya Wildlife Service, where he was responsible for biodiversity research and monitoring across the protected areas. 
In 2017, Dr. Kanga was awarded the Head of State Commendation in recognition for his outstanding and distinguished services in the field of biodiversity conservation. In his current responsibilities as the Secretary for Wildlife, he provides leadership on strategy and policy direction, as well as stakeholder coordination in the wildlife sector. Joining us also for today's dialogue are Dr. Paula Cuello, who is the Secretary of State for the Environment of the Republic of Angola, having served previously as the Minister of Environment for Angola. Dr. Paula has an extensive experience in working to address environmental challenges in Angola and has been at the forefront in advancing issues related to biodiversity, climate change, strengthening of the policies related to wildlife, waste management, soil and water conservation, and environmental education. Also joining us on the panel today are Emmanuel de Marot, who has been director of the Virunga National Park of the Democratic Republic, Republic of Congo since 2008. Mr. de Marot strives to protect endangered wildlife in Central and Eastern Africa, and his main focus has been on supporting the work of African wildlife rangers in conflict-affected areas by driving economic development in partnership with local communities. His work has primarily been in the parks of Eastern DRC, working to sustain the national parks through the DRC's 20-year civil war. Princess Laurentine, you have the floor. Thank you, Jorge, for that uh, introduction. And uh, indeed, it is also my honor to lead this dialogue with such distinguished uh, panelists. Um, I would like to start with um, the issue of this collective action that Jorge is uh, mentioning. Um, it sounds so logical when it comes to um, tackling wildlife crime, but what are the bottlenecks right now that it's not happening? Who would like to start on that overarching question of collective action and why is that not happening right now? What is so difficult about it? And if one of you can start off with that question, what, what is so difficult about collective action? Um, thank you. Um, I think um, my our perspective is is very much a, a local perspective from the field. So in, in some ways, where the damage is done um, in terms of um, environmental destruction um, resulting from trafficking activities, um, I think you know we we certainly suffer greatly from um, the you know, an issue of, how would I call it, rapport de force, a ba balance of power um, with respect to the scale of what trafficking has become. Um, I think it's, a, it's become a much, much more organized um, um, activity that, that permeates through all sectors of economic life um, that, has, um, that has adapted far better to getting results than um, than law enforcement has, and certainly um, cooperation between institutions. Um, so, the very so, um, Emmanuel. So, I hear you say that your work on the ground is perhaps also um, disconnected from the bigger scale, but also maybe political um, uh, places of power. So, all the different elements of the chain are somehow disconnected, I hear you say, from actually the work on the ground that you do. Yes. Um, um, at, at, at every level, it has become more difficult to achieve results. Um, the challenges have become bigger and more, more dangerous. So as, yeah. a, as, an, as an example, um, the threats that law enforcement officers face on the ground are infinitely greater than they were 10 years ago. Um, you know, Virunga being, of course, a, a tragic example of that, with 21 of our staff being killed as a result of trafficking operations in the last 12 months alone. Um, the structures that they're confronted with are far better armed, far better um, trained and organized than, than they were 10 years ago. Um, I think all the way along the chain, that level of organization is being experienced um, and the law enforcement structures that are supposed to counter them have struggled to, to keep, keep pace. 
Yeah, D Dr. Kanga, I saw you nodding when um, Emmanuel was talking, when I was raising the issue of uh, the different elements of the chain, let's say, and the different places being disconnected. Can you, um, uh, does that resonate what you hear um, Emmanuel say? Uh, thank you, thank you, Presence, and uh, for the opportunity to hand up to what Emmanuel is saying. Um, my take is that uh, from the national and international perspective, it's not possible to work alone. It is better to fight corruption uh, uh, collectively together, and uh, we take responsibility. Um, from, uh, from a bottleneck perspective, if you look at uh, what is happening uh, in Kenya, is that uh, we are experiencing weak international cooperations that's affecting the way we are tackling uh, um, uh, world rivalry and uh, corruption internationally. And the countries need to recognize and prioritize addressing corruption as a key area of work to tackle world rivalry and forest crime. We also need uh, very clear and appropriate whistleblowing uh, reporting mechanisms to facilitate the reporting. Otherwise, uh, we are at a huge threat of losing uh, uh, most of our whistleblowers if we don't have very clear mechanism. Kenya is uh, currently working on, um, uh, on a web-based complaint intake management system that would be geared towards uh, protecting uh, our whistleblowers. But um, at the national perspective, we have various uh, key institutions that yeah. must work collectively. And at the international level, we need to identify very clear development partners. It is not an issue of willingness. It is an issue of confronting a problem that as a society we have to deal with. But and I hear especially also this this cooperation between the national and the international. Can you elaborate? Why is that so difficult? Um, I think it's uh, because of uh, the different uh, uh, the different policy and regulatory framework at each country level, and also it also depends on the inter the the, the, the foreign policies of different countries. Yeah. In, yeah. It's a process that we have we, we, we have to build, but above all, the key thing is goodwill. If yeah. goodwill is lacking, then we are not going to surmount this problem. Goodwill is a key element here. Um, uh, from the Angolan perspective, are, is that something that you are also um, uh, that this resonates with you, um, uh, Dr. Paula, or are there other elements that have not been mentioned? that you have identified as key bottlenecks for you to fight this in a collaborative manner? Uh, well, I will add on my voice. Thank you, Princess, for that. But I'll add on my voice saying that um, I think the problem also is because of the time on the leadership, if you look at the whole, um, whole process. Mm -hmm. uh, many of our uh, people, leaders, we, we try to fight and tackle but we, we are there in the system for many, many years. And uh, there are also issues uh, in our case that uh, tackles concerning about social incomes. Mostly we face those difficulties in the border side. And when it comes to international cooperation, it goes like it will depend, of course, on what is the priority of the country and also what is your legislation. And when it comes to international help or guidance, this is why there's been a, a lot of efforts to say that, no, we need to have uh, a, a methodology that will suit us all. And this is wh where we need to see really on the ground, how can you use this uh, tool that suits us all according to the, our law? Because at the end of the day, each country is sovereign, is sovereign for its own decisions, yeah. but still uh, the lack of collaboration will not only be under the international bodies or the local bodies, but yeah. I would like really much more to agree with the, when Emmanuel says that it's local, because from our experience, we had to capacitate uh, prosecutors and judges to make them understand what is this illegal trade, what is this corruption, what is wildlife, why we fight and why is important. Not only for the sake that we know elephants, uh, giraffes and are good and we need to preserve them for future generations, 
but because we need to understand what is the worth why these animals are alive for future generation what are we are doing to nature so, so up to this level yes yeah. <laughs> sorry no 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 it, it, clearly you obviously have so much uh, to tell and so much to add but what i'm hearing you say is this fragmentation um, at all levels um, uh, as emmanuel says at all levels um, it's hard to achieve results because the scale of the issues, it's becoming more dangerous, the scale is bigger, um, uh, more organized crime, it's all um, uh, more difficult. Um, but I'm also hearing you say at different levels that there's different definitions, there's different interests, there's different networks, but there's also different opinions on what are the right solutions. And I hear you say that the issue of sovereignty of different uh, countries is obviously a key one, which plays against this notion of um, international c collaboration. Do you have any thoughts? Uh, let's stop um, uh, analyzing where the bottlenecks are. Where are the solutions? What are the opportunities to get it right? Emmanuel, do you have any, any thoughts? I realize that you, with your feet on the ground, have your particular perspective, but if you put it at a strategic level, where are the opportunities to get this right? Well, um, thank you. Um, it's it's something we've been working on for, for 15 years, so this very specific problem. Um, the, the scale of, of the difficulty can be captured in the figures. Um, the trafficking industry in Virunga is estimated at about $170 million a year. Um, and um, and it's important to look at it in its fullness, as it were, um, not just wildlife, but the wildlife habitats um, and the resources around that are contained within these natural ecosystems that, that are exploited as part of an illegal um, trade, a, a, a trafficking network. Um, um, of course, the Park Service, um, um, its 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 revenue um, is infinitely smaller than that, and it's just not in a position to confront. Emmanuel, um, I'm going to be tough on you. I'm going to be because yeah. we're, we're we need we need to get beyond because that's indeed what this uh, UN Crime Congress is also about. Can we identify from your perspectives um, uh, opportunities that perhaps you, from your perspective, have identified? Well, listen, if this is what we do better. We need to scale that up to match the magnitude of the problems. But what are the what is the one thing where you say, okay, why don't we do this on a bigger scale? Yeah. So um, um, it's important just to um, to define the problem, which we've now done yeah. um, at our level. The solution, of course, is to do with resources that are available to counter them. Um, um, it's a $170 million problem. We need a solution on that scale. Um, and that and that's much more than just the park service. It's, as you're saying, it's cooperation, but well-funded cooperation that has a high level of integrity. Um, and that's not going to come from donors. The funding simply isn't available. And so we have to think more creatively um, and see it as a societal problem that's really nested in the economy, in the political economy. We need to build um, an, a, a legal economy that that is an effective counterweight to the illegal trafficking. I mean, it's really, it's there that we need to find the solutions. Um, I think in Virunga, um, we, it, it, it's specifically what we've worked on for 15 years. Um, by 2030, um, the balance of power in terms of the political economy, economy we think, will have shifted. Um, so it's not just um, that solutions have been identified, it's they are being implemented, um, but it's a race against time. Yeah. Um, and we need to find ways of, of, of accelerating that. And that's really driving the legal economy, yeah. identifying opportunities to make this wildlife more, um, more viable from an economic perspective. So, um, Dr. Paula, Dr. Paula, if I connect what Emmanuel is saying to earlier, you're saying it's not a political priority. I hear resources to match up to the magnitude of the problem. There needs to be more money. Um, uh, there needs to be a recognition 
of the the importance of the issue in the bigger scheme of things in the political um, economy. Why? How to make this? Not why, but how to make this then a political priority? What are the levers to uh, to look at? Okay. I believe that we all need to do a little bit of review what we have been doing for the last, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, we are all bounded to the same protocols, agreements, and I would like not only to talk at the political level or the engagement of countries. Uh, because uh, as we go down to the field, we see that experience that the Rangers have on the ground, they are also a lot different. And this also counts for the decision maker to see how are we going to identify progress. Let me say um, we are very lucky here in Angola to have from the desert to the forest and to Mopani and to open grasslands. So we have this experience, but we, 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 we need to understand really as we are doing the, the diagnostics of the problem, why are on these all different areas, the problem may raise and where are we feeding on? Once we have this outcome, and of course we have now the African Declaration for Prosecutors, but now we know all these uh, extraditions and so on, how are they going to move out? And we are having success that we're presenting on the last COP. I think that exercise is the one that we should take and scale up through collaboration, through cooperation, and through a team that is a rapid response team. This is why we have uh, the UN, uh, UN DOC uh, tools and so on, but we need to speak more as well. Yeah. Uh, one of the outcomes that we should maybe not to scale up, but to reduce because it's already scaled up, maybe we should break down now, is the Rangers Congress. It's only one yearly or when conditions are. So still, we as decision makers, we need to pay more attention. Since we do have revenues from the park, we, of course, they, they also are add on to our GDPs per country, but we need to see maybe if it's not 60 to 40%, but we need to put it more. But the problem is the more we increase, the more we become, the more trafficking also increases yeah. because of the awareness. So then uh, I, I should look also, uh, I like very much the team of uh, environmental education and capacity building for communities. And this is something also that will, uh, will if, help a lot. Yeah, if I can, if I can just turn to Dr. Kanga, um, um, what I'm hearing you say as well is that there are different roles. We need to rethink and review different roles that people have. So my question to you, Dr. Kanga, is, um, uh, I hear different roles also at a political level. There's the Ministry of Environment, there's the Ministry of Finance, and there's the Ministry of uh, Legal Affairs. And that's um, connected also to the in international cooperation. Are, who is your interlocutor when it comes to uh, tackling this issue um, in Kenya? Are you talking to all ministries? And, and, and where are you going to get the money and the resources that Emmanuel is talking about that are needed? Uh, thank you, thank you, Princess. Uh, the situation in Kenya is uh, quite clear in the sense that uh, from the president, the president has declared zero tolerance to corruption. And uh, pursuant to that, uh, he has ensured that uh, all the sectors and institutions that are involved in uh, anti-corruption are independent and they are well resourced. Now, learning from that point, the next level that we do is uh, we have a networking mechanism through what we call the multi-agency approach. That we have uh, a one government mechanism as opposed to institutional approach. So every sector that is uh, that, that has a role in anti-corruption, mm -hmm. they are grouped together in the and in the multi-agency approach and moving down. Uh, we do a lot of uh, sharing of good practices. And we move down again, we identify the priority areas to tackle corruption. And uh, as a country, uh, especially in the wildlife sector, we have mainstreamed anti-corruption practices, especially at our lead, lead agency, 
the Kenya Wildlife Service with a lot of capacity building. And uh, back into your question of resources, we have ensured that uh, resources are available for all matters of um, anti-corruption in our sector, and that has rent to a lot of high-level arrests of people that are engaged in uh, corruption, which spill over into poaching. And is it difficult um, when it comes to pulling resources together that um, uh, there's a different perspective and a different language and a different um, uh, frame of thinking between those different ministries, let alone from the international level? Um, uh, a, a minister of environment, a minister of, um, uh, of legal affairs and the minister of finance, they all have their different perspectives. That is my uh, understanding, um, uh, let alone from banks. And is it not also about bringing together those different worlds into a, a connective framework of thinking? Um, is that something that uh, resonates with you, uh, Dr. Paula? I see you, that the, you're <laughs> recognizing what I'm mentioning. Yes, and uh, I would like to add that um, for our experience, Ministers of Environment, ministers in charge of wildlife, tourism, they need to do a double uh, work to engage other sectors. Um, we are indeed recognized that we can contribute for economy, but a project takes longer to achieve a level that there is an income according to the satisfaction of our the GDP, for instance. And uh, this is why uh, there's a lot of uh, formula that we are now uh, working on. We're now leading on the phase of nature-based solutions. But before that, we have the 10, uh, the IG targets under the CBD. But when you, see to, when, when you sit down to translate those into programs integrated, uh, I must say that we need to, 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 to say a very big thank you for the Sustainable Development Goals where now, with the awareness that the world has, we will mainstreaming sustainability and to push other sectors all together and to say, wait, can you stop breathing? Then this is how we play here. If you don't give me more support for either civil society or private sector concerning those matters, can you imagine if you close your if you close your air and then this is how we start you know, engaging them. But now there is more awareness. And of course, uh, the conferences, we had to expose them more to these subjects. And also even at the deputy level, now we are in a process to have the first NGO for the, for the parliament who is going to advocate environment, which is very good as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, closing, you were living in unprecedented time. And um, uh, I would love to hear from you, uh, starting with you, Emmanuel. Um, does this global COVID uh, crisis does it um, raise your hope in um, in in tackling this and becoming more collaborative in realizing that uh, this is a priority also at political level, demanding the, the necessary resources, or are you? Um, in despair and saying we're shifting our priorities to other places and we do not realize how important it is to address corruption linked to wildlife and forest crime. Where, where is your sense of this? Are, is it, are we upping the game with COVID or is it uh, being downplayed? Well, I think the, the only good thing about COVID is that we're still here, um, still working, still struggling on. Um, in, in every other respect, it's been an enormous challenge, um, and particularly on, you know, on the theme of our discussions um, relating to, to trafficking. Um, one, one aspect, of course, is the closing down of international cooperation, the closing down of international borders, which is an enormous handicap for the legal sectors and an enormous opportunity for those who traffic across those borders. Um, it plays into their hands. Um, can you explain? Can you explain why that is? Why is it for them um, um, more? Why is it playing into their hands? Well, it, it affects us very, very specifically because we're a um, we're a transboundary protected area. We're on the borders yeah. with uh, and Rwanda. Um, in closing down the borders, um, trade is hampered. Uh, legal trade is hampered. 
illegal trade becomes much more lucrative. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, that generates more revenue for um, illegal traffic, for illegal, illegal trade. Um, to, to up to the law enforcement when it comes to, um, uh, and, and what would be your suggestion to get that right? Because that's obviously an important perspective, particularly in this time when we don't have insights when this going to stop this closing of borders. Yeah, I mean, what 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 has happened is that um, um, agencies like ours, but in many African countries, have um, you know have have had to become much more resilient, much more self reliant, um, and in doing so, in going through these enormous difficulties, um, solutions are found. You know, for us, it's to really drive all the, the the local revenue and the strength of the teams on the ground um, to to get through these very very challenging times and some of that has has worked yeah um, accepting that tourism has collapsed which is one of the main sources of revenue yeah. for uh, wildlife protection and looking towards other sources of revenue like um, like renewable energy um, which you know we we've worked on very hard other parks have worked on as well which is much more resilient to um, these very, 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 very difficult challenges. Yeah. And Dr. Kanga, what what do we need to do differently and what um, uh, in, in, in light of COVID um, in terms of either the threats or possibly opportunities that you spot in this particularly trying times? What needs to be done differently? Thank you, Princess. First, I'll give a, a scenario of Kenya similar to what Emmanuel has gone through. Uh, COVID has uh, brought uh, the tourism sector to a standstill and uh, the implication of that is that uh, there is a complete out of revenue and that has put a lot of pressure on, uh, uh, on, on, on matters of corruption related to wildlife and uh, criminality would be on the increase among us to our stakeholders. The decrease in revenue means that uh, we have less resources that uh, we can put on patrols and also on enforcement to prevent the crime. However, our Kenyan scenario, and this could be what we can do better, uh, through our president uh, looking at uh, the level of unemployment, the president announced what we are calling economic stimulus program. And we are able to net um, local communities around our protected areas being given a stimulus for two years and we are engaging them in what we call work for money. So we've employed the local communities, uh, more than uh, more than 10,000 of them. And 10,000 of them are looking at uh, those are individuals who are, manning, uh, who are manning households. That's a huge population that the government is feeding money into. And um, the implication of that is that that is a disincentive to yeah. get involved in world drive crimes here. Um, unfortunately, I would have loved to uh, to spend all day uh, talking to you, and clearly there are so many different angles to explore. But um, I'd like to uh, close with you, Dr. Paula, just to say um, you're clearly passionate about um, uh, fighting this. You have a holistic and very strategic approach and a true vision about this. Is COVID making your work harder to really put this at the political um, priority? No, it is it is making difficult. First of all, it's something that we cannot control. Yeah. We do not know who is porting from one place to the other. Uh, nevertheless, the biosafety measures into place and uh, looking at the conservation areas, uh, closing the border, providing, let's say, intra type of tourism, let's say within provinces, but still is very difficult. And because now we had to redo all other all other GDP to address COVID, combating COVID, and also with waste management practices, so it's becoming in. Let's say uh, many people are going home. Getting there's also another issue raising up like psychology problem that we need to address because people are a little bit um, confused on what is the next step. And yep. yet we need to reprogram. So it's becoming a little bit frustrating somehow. And with, this is why I also believe that uh, specific programs and there is undergoing some debate that we, what is it that we need to do and how efficient is all this 
let's say working online and so on because some people they don't do not have access but still we need to continue the empowerment of the country thank you so much i think that you touched on really uh, key issues um uh, concerned um what i'm hearing you say is that um uh, reviewing things that need to be done differently is an opportunity that this crisis is providing um, but also that it is making it harder and that collaborative action within countries is more important than ever before and nationally, locally, nationally and internationally is also more important than ever before. So we need to spend our resources wisely to actually start addressing this at a really fundamental level. I thank you for your voices, for your wisdom and I wish you every success in your individual positions and roles in fighting this. And let's stick together because, as Emmanuel says, we're running out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to thank this eminent group for sharing their wisdom, their ideas, and their dedication to protecting our environment and for calling on all of us to act together against crime and corruption in the wildlife and forest spheres. We take the message to heart, and we hope that they've inspired you to act with courage and commitment to addressing these crimes. I now welcome Ambassador Marsha Bernicat. Ambassador Bernicat is currently serving at the U.S. Department of State in a dual role as Senior Official for Economic Growth, Energy and the Environment, and as Acting Assistant Secretary for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. Her distinguished career in the Foreign Service, where she holds the rank of Minister Counselor, has included positions as Ambassador to Bangladesh, Ambassador to Senegal and Guinea-Bissau, Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Human Resources, Deputy Chief of Mission in Barbados, Deputy Chief of Mission in Malawi, and Principal Officer in Casablanca, Morocco. Ambassador Bernicat is the recipient of the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award and numerous other departmental awards. Ambassador Bernicat, it's a pleasure to have you with us. You have the floor. Hello, my name is Marsha Bernica. I'm the Senior Official for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment at the U.S. Department of State. I would like to thank the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime for hosting this important event. I am pleased to be part of the Crime Congress this year and look forward to when we can meet in person again. First of all, Happy International Women's Day. From civil society, to law enforcement, to prosecutors and judges, women are working at every level of crime prevention. This includes women like Flor de Maria Vega Zapata, who leads a team of lawyers to prosecute criminals engaged in illegal logging and illegal mining in her country, Peru. By dismantling criminal networks while fearlessly defying threats to her personal safety, she has paved the way for other women and men to act. The State Department named her as an International Woman of Courage in 2019 to reflect her outstanding achievements. As we reflect on the theme of today's event, the nature of corruption, we are also supporting women across the globe who are fighting corruption on the ground. This corruption facilitates the illegal exploitation of our precious natural world. Conservation crimes include wildlife and timber trafficking, illegal mining, and illegal fishing. They threaten the stability and security of the states and societies in which we live. Criminal syndicates traffic in persons, drugs, and weapons, robbing local communities of their natural resources. These same criminal syndicates launder billions of dollars in illicit proceeds. We combat these crimes most effectively at the points where they converge, not simply as separate and distinct crimes. Combating conservation crimes is also good for our health. Approximately 75% of emerging infectious diseases, such as Ebola and COVID-19, are zoonotic in nature, meaning they can be transmitted from animals to humans. To prevent future pandemics, 
we need to embrace a One Health approach that recognizes the links between the health of people, animals, and the environment. We also need to find ways to reduce human contact with high-risk wildlife that occurs through illegal habitat encroachment, animal markets, and wildlife trafficking. Conservation crimes affect everyone, and we know we cannot counter them alone. We work across the U.S. government and with the global com community to strengthen international cooperation. In addition, we are building capacity for law enforcement in our own country and yours to investigate and successfully prosecute those who illegally trade in wildlife, timber, fish, and minerals. The United States is committed to combating conservation crimes, and we look forward to continuing this conversation with you throughout this Congress. Thank you very much, Ambassador Bernicat. And we're also delighted that a little later we'll be hearing from Florida Maria. Now let me turn the floor over to Ernestine Rengill. Ernestine Rengill is the first woman lawyer in Palau and the first Palauan woman to serve as Attorney General. She has been at the forefront of advocating the importance of cooperation and strong measures to address corruption and other crimes in the fisheries sector with a view to protecting the abundant marine resources of the Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings from the Republic of Palau. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak at this special event on corruption and environmental crime for the 14th UN Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. I understand this is the first UN Congress on crime prevention and environmental crime after the sustainable development goals were adopted. The fisheries sector has much to contribute to achieving all the sustainable development goals, but it is at the core of SDG 14, which is to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. The global fisheries industry has a profound daily impact on our environment, our health, and our economies globally. Today, more than 3.3 billion people in the world rely on fish for 20% of their average per capita intake of animal proteins. This figure reaches 50% or more in developing coastal countries and small island developing states like Palau. The livelihood and income of approximately 10% of the global population depends on capture fishing and aquaculture. However, the nature and complexity of the fishing sector the differences in regulations among countries and in many places weak government oversight in the fisheries value chain provide many possibilities for exploitation by criminal syndicates leading to disastrous human and environmental consequences. The fisheries sector is particularly important for many small Pacific states. For example, my country Palau is situated in a section of the Pacific that offers easy access to a bounty of marine resources, while also being one of the prime reefs and deep water diving areas of the world. At the same time, this privileged geographic location and significant exclusive economic zone makes Palau highly vulnerable to risks of unscrupulous individuals and organized criminal groups looking to exploit and benefit from Palau's vast natural resources. Palau, as many other small Pacific states, is a prime target for IUU fishing and is vulnerable to corruption and other economic crimes in the fisheries value chain. As a pioneer state in oceans protection, Palau has recognized that addressing IUU fishing is not enough. Palau must address the broad range of crimes in the fisheries sector, including corruption as a main enabler of these crimes, which not only impact the health of our ocean, but also undermine global efforts to responsibly manage fisheries, resources, and the collection of revenue into our national treasury. All this is particularly important in the context of the current global pandemic. Palau is only at the start of its efforts, but it has already taken some important steps. On October 28, 2015, Palau enacted the National Marine Sanctuaries Act in an effort to close off a significant portion of its waters to fishing, 
allowing only nationally licensed and registered fishing vessels to operate in its waters. To limit the loss of revenue, Palau passed an amendment on June 12, 2019 to allow for longline fishing within the domestic fishing zone. It is our hope that this initiative will both improve the livelihoods of local fishermen and conserve and improve fish stocks. The National Marine Sanctuary, which designates 80% of Palau's exclusive economic zone is a no-take zone, free from exploitation, became fully functional on January 1, 2020. Together with UNODC, Palau has brought together Micronesian countries to identify risks related to crimes in the fisheries value chain and develop strategies to address these risks. With effective interagency coordination and strong international cooperation, we can make a difference to protect our oceans. We are also planning to undertake a national corruption risk assessment to better understand the vulnerabilities in our fisheries value chain. We realize the utmost importance of this exercise for the protection of our natural resources and national revenue. I encourage other countries to follow our example. The vulnerability of our shared oceans makes the threat of IUU fishing and crimes in the fisheries sector a very serious one. Time is running out, then we must all work together to address the corruption that facilitates these crimes in order to achieve our shared sustainable development goals. Thank you and have a productive and successful 14th UN Congress on crime prevention and criminal justice. Thank you very much, Ernestine. It's always a pleasure to work with you and our friends in Palau. And I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate Palau for its strong commitment to address corruption in the fisheries sector. I now have the pleasure to introduce Flor de Maria Vega. Dr. Vega is Peru's National Coordinator for Environmental Prosecutors and leads a team of prosecutors to investigate and prosecute transnational criminal organizations engaged in environmental crime such as illegal logging and illegal mining and wildlife trafficking. Today, she is speaking on behalf of the Peruvian Attorney General. In 2016, Dr. Vega and her team brought together Peru's environmental enforcement agencies to disrupt illegal mining activities, resulting in 500 law enforcement operations against illegal miners. Her efforts to train, equip, and mentor her prosecutor's team resulted in the first convictions for illegal mining cases in 2019. Dr. Vega led her prosecutorial team in Iquitos to investigate and seize $1.6 million worth in illegal timber, the largest illegal logging shipment in Peru's history. Her work on the illegal logging case proved to be a watershed moment in Peru's fight against this crime. For her outstanding work in combating environmental crime, Dr. Vega was recognized with the U.S. State Department's International Women of Courage Award in 2019. Le saluda Flor de María Vega Zapata, Fiscal Superior Coordinadora Nacional de las Fiscalías Especializadas en Materia Ambiental del Perú. El Perú consideramos que es un país de bosques, porque estos ocupan casi el 60% de nuestro territorio. Poseemos un total de 70 millones de hectáreas de todo tipo de bosques, distribuidos en la Amazonía, los Andes y los bosques secos de la costa. Estos mantienen una gran biodiversidad y es hábitat de nuestros pueblos indígenas. Nuestros bosques sufren graves amenazas y deforestación por actividades económicas relacionadas a la tala ilegal, monocultivos, agroindustria, la construcción de grandes proyectos de infraestructura, el cambio de uso de suelo, la minería ilegal, entre otros motores de deforestación, en una coyuntura en donde se sabe que la corrupción afecta todos los sistemas del gobierno. Desde enero del año 2019 a diciembre del 2020, se ha incautado aproximadamente 10.113.87 metros cúbicos de madera y 2.2.441.383.44 pies tablares de producto forestal maderable. Además, 26.000 trozas de madera rolliza todo ello a nivel nacional. Esta madera, que muchas veces la encontramos en los ríos, hemos previsto, con el apoyo del Ejército del Perú, 
realizar muebles y bienes para poblaciones vulnerables de la selva, por ejemplo, mesas, camas, y en este COVID hemos construido con esta madera de extracción ilegal 250 ataúdes para los miembros de las comunidades nativas. Casos asociados a la corrupción y delitos forestales. Los hostiles de la Amazonía en la región Madre de Dios. Regentes forestales corruptos en la región Loreto. Menonitas en regiones de Loreto y Ucayali. Cocha Ania en la región Ucayali. Yacucalpa en la región Loreto. Los patrones de Ucayali. Los castores de Selva Central y Tansiyacu. Durante el año 2019 y el año 2020, las fiscalías especializadas en materia ambiental han investigado más de 3.800 casos por delitos contra los bosques y más de 3.819 casos relacionados a delitos de tráfico ilegal de especies forestales maderables, que dan un total de 7.619 casos sobre delitos forestales, en muchos de los cuales se han realizado operativos de interdicción contra la tal ilegal en el marco del Decreto Legislativo 1220. Se viene participando activamente desde la coordinación FEMA y a través del personal fiscal de las Fiscalías Especializadas de Materia ambi Ambiental a nivel nacional en mesas, grupos de trabajo u otros encuentros similares de carácter interinstitucional, nacional e internacional, con el objeto de mejorar los mecanismos de coordinación y gestión con otras autoridades competentes en la gestión forestal y demás instituciones vinculadas directa o indirectamente al sector forestal. Retos en la lucha contra los delitos forestales y la corrupción desde las Fiscalías Especializadas de Materia Ambiental. Optimizar los recursos logísticos de las Fiscalías Especializadas en Materia Ambiental con competencia territorial en regiones de mayor incidencia de delitos forestales. Continuar con la implementación de medios tecnológicos en los distritos fiscales que reportan altos índices de delitos forestales. Ello constituye un reto importante para la coordinación, además contar con las unidades de monitoreo de georreferenciación satelital en las regiones de Amazonas, San Martín y Piura. Lograr un mayor fortalecimiento de las capacidades en el personal fiscal sobre aspectos de ética profesional a fin de prevenir actos irregulares en la función fiscal que puedan devenir en actos de corrupción. Consideramos necesario y preponderante revertir la sensación de impunidad imperante en el país, actuando dentro de nuestras funciones y competencias para sancionar, como corresponde, aquellos que vienen contraviniendo la legislación forestal. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Dr. Vega. Prue's work on addressing crimes that affect the environment is to be commended, and we are so delighted to be working with Dr. Vega and her team to address these challenges. I'd now like to introduce Mr. Marco Lambertini. As Director General of WWF International, Marco Lambertini heads one of the world's largest and most respected conservation organizations. With over 25 years of global conservation, leadership, field, and campaigning experience around the world, Marco leads with, works with world leaders, corporate executives, international organizations, and civil society to forge a future in which people and nature thrive. Thank you for this opportunity to address this special event, the nature of corruption. You're all familiar with crime convergence, and today I want to talk about the convergence of wildlife crime, corruption, human rights, and gender equality. COVID-19 has brought into focus our unsustainable relationship with the planet, with nature. A broken relationship driven often by greed, the same greed fueling inequality and discrimination. Corruption is a primary tool to fulfill unscrupulous greed. Corruption, something that for a long time was not easy to talk about and still is an uncomfortable word. There has been progress, but uh, there's still a long way to go uh, on our collective journey to eradicate it. Shifting the focus from vulnerable people to higher level actors in environmental crime and illegal wildlife trade is key. And corruption facilitates illicit flows, natural resources, as well as financial flows, drives nature degradation and wildlife decimation, deprives local communities of natural resources, 
and youth of opportunities and diverse revenue that could otherwise have been supported governments to meet their development goals. Gender discrimination, another plague of many social contexts, is also rarely linked to environmental crime. How environmental crimes are perpetrated through corruption, gender inequality, intimidation, and the horror of labor and sexual exploitation is just beginning to be understood. All these are facilitators of illegal wildlife trade along with its brutal value chains affecting nature and vulnerable people, including women and those targeted by obsolete social taboos and stigmas, for example, related to sexual orientation, the LGBTQI communities. There is ample evidence that in environmental crime, women are more severely affected by particular forms of corruption and exploitation. Gender differentiated experiences of corruption, often linked to sexual abuse, have more adverse impacts on victims than monetary corruption. And it arises whenever it, there is a power differential, uh, making a strong link to the broader gender equality agenda. It is not included in the UN Convention Against Corruption. It is therefore excluded also from <clears throat> most estimates uh, of the pre prevalence of corruption. It is time to recognize these linkages. Distinguished delegates, on the positive side, we also know that gender equality is strongly correlated with environmental sustainability and the gender inclusive decision making bodies have better outcomes. This applies <clears throat> to the role of women in fighting poaching, illegal logging and fishing, both as community members or when employed in law enforcement efforts, for example, anti-poaching ventures. Women in enforcement uh, increases effectiveness and has a demonstrable effect in preventing community members from engaging with illegal wildlife trade, decreasing violence and increasing community trust. <clears throat> the NODC's own research regarding policing corroborates this. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates, the WBF mission is about the conservation of nature and the harmony between nature and people. We believe passionately that our civilization is experiencing a new awakening to the risks posed by climate change and natural loss and the opportunities and benefits of transition towards sustainability, delivering an equitable, climate neutral and nature positive society and economy. We welcome the growing attention to the issue of corruption and its ramifications. We are proud as WWF <clears throat> to lead the targeting a natural resources corruption consortium with the U4 Anti-Corruption Resource Center, Traffic and TRA CCC to deepen understanding regarding corruption in the natural resource sector and to pilot new approaches to address it. We're proud to have partnered with the ACAMS, the Association of Anti-Money Laundering Specialists. And WBF is one of the eight members of the Universal Ranger Support Alliance, which through its rights-based action plan seeks to professionalize the Rangers workforce strengthen employers' institutions, uh, and foster responsibility and accountability. And we are proud to have contributed to the UNODS uh, um, uh, Scaling Back uh, Corruption, the excellent guide on corruption prevention for wildlife management authorities. More of this collective uh, response and efforts is required. Environmental crime, corruption, and gender equality and other forms uh, of uh, uh, human rights, uh, uh, respect of human rights, are undermining the lives of the planet's most vulnerable and nature itself. The time to act is now, and we are proud and committed to continue to work together with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. WWF is an important partner in addressing corruption, and we remain grateful for the support and expertise from our partners in the civil society sector. On that note, I welcome to the floor Ms. Olivia Swack Goldman. Olivia Swack Goldman is the Executive Director of the Wildlife Justice Commission. The WJC undertakes undercover intelligence driven investigations to provide governments with information and evidence which aids in disrupting and dismantling crime networks that traffic wildlife, timber, and fish. The intelligence picture that WJC helps to paint spans borders and makes multi-agency law enforcement cooperation possible. Olivia has 25 years experience in international justice and diplomacy 
and she's worked at the International Criminal Court, the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Iran United States Claims Tribunal, the UN International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and Leiden University, and has published extensively on issues of international criminal law and international humanitarian law. My name is Olivia Swak goldman and I'm the Executive Director of the Wildlife Justice Commission. And I'd like to thank UNODC for including the Wildlife Justice Commission in this important panel on the linkage between corruption and wildlife, fishery, and timber crime. Now, I'd like to look at this issue from the point of view of crime convergence, namely the linkages between wildlife crime and other forms of transnational organized crime, and the linkage of wildlife crime with corruption. A good example of a successful operation that addressed linkages between wildlife crime and other forms of transnational organized crime is Operation Apex, conducted by several U.S. law enforcement agencies in September of 2020. The relevant syndicate was selling shark fin from Mexico to Hong Kong and drugs to the United States. Now, the successful completion showed not only the linkages, but also the importance of a coordinated multi-agency approach to address it. Now, wildlife crime would not occur at this level without corruption. Corruption facilitates the processing, the sale, and the distribution of wildlife. So it's really important that we address corruption if we're going to be successful in addressing wildlife crime. The Wildlife Justice Commission documented corruption in its Operation Dragon, which looked into the trafficking of turtles and, and tortoises across Southeast Asia. Now, this operation not only succeeded in seizing 6,000 turtles and tortoises and disrupting eight criminal networks, but also documenting the corruption in the transport hubs that facilitated this criminal activity. And all of the traffickers that we spoke with mentioned their corrupt facilitators that helped them conduct their criminal activity. So it was a really important documentation. But what are the next steps? Now, the Wildlife Justice Commission is putting together a report with detailed case studies about the convergence of wildlife crime with other forms of organized crime and the massive corruption that it entails. UNODC is also playing a leading role in creating a follow-up mechanism on the issue of crime convergence. So how do we take this further? Now, the Wildlife Justice Commission, we think there are four issues that need to be addressed. First is the use of intelligence analysis, the use of specialized investigative techniques, the establishment of anti-corruption bodies, and a coordinated law enforcement approach. And none of these mechanisms are, are new. They're all enshrined, in fact, already into the UN Anti-Corruption Convention, which has 187 member states. The question is how we go from having these mechanisms on paper to actually having them implemented. Now, this Crime Congress and the UN General Assembly special session in June of this year allow us the opportunity to work together to try and find solutions to this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olivia. WJC is doing important work in the area and has been at the forefront of supporting intelligence-led wildlife crime investigations. I now welcome Ambassador Hislaine Doop of the Kingdom of Belgium. His Excellency Doop is a permanent representative of Belgium to the United Nations Office at Vienna. And he also serves as Ambassador of the Kingdom of Belgium to Austria, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Bosnia-Herzegovina. His personal attachment to rights and values and his background as an economist underpin his strong commitment to working together with UNODC to address corruption and economic crimes, particularly those that affect the environment. And he is a strong proponent of UNODC's strategic vision for Africa. Mr. Ambassador, you have the floor. Your Royal Highnesses, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to speak to you today on behalf of our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Sophie Wittnes. Belgium is truly heartened by the strong statements and commitments expressed during this event. Corruption linked to wildlife, forest and fisheries crime threatens the livelihood of people. It affects biodiversity. 
It impacts socioeconomic growth and even national security and public health. It robs countries of opportunities for development and undermines all activities taken worldwide to fight wildlife crime. UNODC plays a vital and central role in strengthening targeted action and international cooperation to fight these crimes. We need to join forces with UNODC to uphold the values, principles and rights which the UN treaties and conventions embody and safeguard. The principle of the rule of law is challenged by transnational organized criminal groups, undermining legislative frameworks and institutions that engage every day in preventing these crimes. The rule of law remains an essential precondition for economic and human development growth. Let us aim to reduce risks of corruption within wildlife management authorities and intensify financial investigations. By strengthening the judicial capability of countries and communities to combat wildlife crime and the trafficking of natural resources, states will be more equipped to prevent, detect, investigate and prosecute these crimes. Belgium is proud to support wildlife projects in Africa. We call on other countries and organisations to join us in these efforts. We show our deepest respect and admiration to the director of the Virunga National Park, Emmanuel de Mero. His constant commitment over the years is exemplary and inspires us all to further commit all our forces to fighting corruption and crime linked to wildlife. Concerted and collective action is needed every day guided by the Sustainable Development Goals and inspired by the impressive work of the UNODC. It is a combat which requires our commitment and our firm resolve. Let's achieve this together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Duk. I now have the pleasure to introduce Ambassador Zapier Sticker, who is currently the permanent representative of France to the United Nations and international organizations in Vienna. Previously, he was the French ambassador at large for the environment from 2014 to 2019, when he notably created the French Interministerial Task Force on Combating Wildlife Crime. Ambassador, you have the floor. Dear participants, 2021 is a special year, a special year for nature and a special year for the fight against crime. Because indeed, we will be meeting and are meeting now uh, for the uh, Crime Congress of the United Nations in, in Kyoto. But I would like to stress that it will be also on the year of the World Conservation Congress of IUCN in Marseille in September. And it will be the year of uh, the uh, uh, major uh, conference of parties and to the Biodiversity Convention uh, later this year uh, in the fall in Kunming, China. My country uh, is uh, committed uh, to uh, mobilizing the uh, international community uh, and to uh, indeed uh, acting in terms of uh, national commitments, of international cooperation against uh, environmental crime. Uh, this uh, has been uh, highlighted as a major issue by UNODC, by Interpol, by UNEP and uh, other international uh, organizations in numerous uh, reports. Uh, the connection uh, between uh, environmental crime uh, and uh, corruption is uh, manifold. Uh, criminal groups have diversified their activities. They are illegally uh, exploiting our natural resources, our waste, uh, and this is done on an industrial scale uh, that drives the uh, opportunity to maximize profits while and the risks incurred are so low and corruption fuels uh, the uh, traffic uh, of uh, natural resources and, and waste across borders um, and uh, corruption and can also uh, obstruct uh, the uh, investigations, prosecution, uh, punishment uh, and that only drives up 
are the uh, biodiversity uh, crisis uh, and uh, pollution uh, worldwide. My country welcomes the Kyoto Declaration, which addresses uh, environmental uh, crime and makes it a priority crime. It recognizes uh, that uh, this sort of crime uh, requires a more uh, effective uh, international response and international cooperation. To that end, we can build on two uh, useful, relevant and uh, strong uh, platforms uh, which are the uh, UN uh, Convention uh, Against uh, Transnational Organized Crime, UNTOC, uh, and its uh, sibling convention, UNCAC, uh, the UN Convention Against uh, Corruption. Last year, my country uh, took the uh, initiative of uh, uh, introducing a, a resolution to uh, UNTOC uh, for the first time ever. Uh, it has been recognized that environmental crimes are serious crimes and that they fall within the scope of uh, this uh, convention, uh, as well as uh, Molina laundering and uh, corruption. Uh, one year before, uh, similarly, uh, jointly with, with uh, Belgium, we uh, introduced a resolution uh, to, uh, unco uh, to uh, UNCAC uh, uh, against uh, corruption. Uh, the threat is serious. Uh, and this uh, platform has uh, made uh, decisions on the way uh, to deal with it. So we have an ambitious roadmap. Uh, it's uh, about time to implement it. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I now have the honor and the distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Jane Goodall, a woman who hardly requires an introduction. She'll help us close the event. Through nearly 60 years of groundbreaking work, Dr. Jane Goodall has not only shown us the urgent need to protect species from extinction, but has also redefined species conservation to include the needs of local people and the environment. A legendary ethologist and conservationist, she is known for her long-term and respected work on chimpanzees in the Gambus Stream National Park in Tanzania. Jane is the founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and a UN Messenger of Peace her global humanitarian and environmental program. Roots and Shoots, created 30 years ago, has empowered young people of all ages to become involved in hands-on projects to benefit local communities, animals, and their environment, and is active in more than 60 countries. I am truly honored to be invited to make a few remarks towards the close of this really important event. The illegal wildlife trade has been a major concern to all of us who care about the conservation of our planet's ecosystems, who care about species extinction, biodiversity loss and climate change. They are all interrelated. Currently, many nations are committed to fighting the trade. The involvement of the United Nations Office for Drugs and Crime, UNODC, and Interpol in addition to the conservation community, underscores the fact that this trade, as you all know, is in the hands of transnational criminal syndicates, and they're also involved in money laundering and drugs, arms and human trafficking. Many powerful and influential individuals are becoming increasingly wealthy. The illegal wildlife trade, again, you know it's big business, estimated to be worth about $20 billion a year. And this trade is fuel, fueled by corruption at all levels along the route, from capture of the animals, collection of the plants, to the ultimate destination. And it's driving many species of animals and plants closer and closer to extinction. An added impetus for closing down this trade is its role in creating the COVID-19 pandemic that's caused so much suffering and economic chaos around the world. We're paying the price for not heeding the warning of scientists studying these diseases who've been predicting a pandemic of this sort for years. It's the same disrespect for animals and the environment that has led to the climate crisis. We, after all, are part of the natural world and we depend on it, but we depend on healthy ecosystems. And as the rate of extinction increases, 
and the loss of biodiversity becomes greater, these ecosystems are becoming weaker. We also, of course, have to address the demand for the products, increase efforts to educate the public, find alternative ways of making money for the millions of people who depend on the trade, alleviate poverty, and prosecute those who are involved. <laughs> IWT is a hugely complex problem that can only be solved through cross-border collaboration between different organizations. And that's why this event has been so important. The groundbreaking reports compiled by UNDOC have made a very big difference. And incidentally, the Jane Goodall Institute is working with the Global Initiative to End Wildlife Crime. The variety of influential voices that gathered for this event is fantastic. I want to end with one last important message. At events like this, everyone talks about the effect of the trade on the species, but think of the effect on the individual animals. Each one has a personality. Each one knows fear and feels pain. We're talking about suffering on an unimaginable scale. Each one has been sacrificed on the altar of greed and corruption. And it's only through the collective will of governments, organisations and citizens that we can bring it to an end. For the sake of the future of the planet and for the animals, we must. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for today's special event. As you heard from all the speakers, fighting corruption related to wildlife, forest and fisheries crimes is integral to achieving the Agenda 2030. This is, however, a race against time, and urgent action and political commitment are required if we're to be serious about putting criminal syndicates out of business, protecting our planet's ecosystems, mitigating climate change, and curbing biodiversity loss and deforestation. Today's speakers highlighted that success is possible, and we challenge you to take the fight, shine light on corruption, and work with us to end wildlife crime.